Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. Ah, uh, yeah, folks, it's Monday night once again. I am here with you, Grimnir, live on reallibertymedia.com. This is the Grim Leftovers Show. And you are listening to me live, unless you're hearing a replay, which is uh, highly likely. But uh, if not, welcome. <laughs> anyway, let me say hi and howdy to all the folks that are out there uh, in the various places they're out there anyway. Uh, I don't know who all what might be tuning in, but if you saw the tweet on Twitter, I have two separate accounts there. You could be on see it on either one or over there on Minds.com. I have an account there as well that I send the information out to realliberty.org. They've actually got the player on that site. Yes, indeed. So welcome to the folks on realliberty.org as well as freedomsnetwork.com. Also, we're on rlmradio.xyz, tunein.com, internetradio.com, and various other places. Later on, however, we will be on... Spreaker, we will be on YouTube, we will be on BitChute, all these places, yeah, and uh, Rob Works is apparently playing air guitar with me, and that's interesting, <laughs> anyway, uh, if you're not over here in the chat on reallibertymedia.com, head on over and jump on into the chat, there's a little link button on the side there, pop-up chat, you can jump on in here and listen in with all the great folks that hang out over here. And tonight we have uh, the barman and myself, the mighty moose girl, uh, Mr. Anti and Asmo and Beth Z, uh, Mr. Chalcedony, Graham Z, hey grabby. We got Don Z, I B Don Z, to be correct there. The Java Doctor, Meester Meisterbrow, the Ponder Gander, uh, yeah, the uh, connector of voices there. Uh, Miss Kate and Rob works in Rome's. The Vanna Whitebot, Mr. Vin E., who's kind of Ponder Gander-ish in his own way. Uh, we got the Weather Dork Bot to tell you what the heck temperature it is outside your house today and for the next coming week. We got Phantom and Circle in the Cyborg Noodle. And uh, Siv and Flash Somebody, who it must be pretty late there in Flash, Flash Somebody's Town. And he's got a show to do later on this evening. He comes on at 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Tuesday morning, so just a few hours from now. We got the Frumpton Gooberzilla. We got Gromit and, huh? Huh? JJ's, hey JJ's. Uh, over there in Scotland. And we got Kiss and Prince and Pone Sauce and the Sock Puppet in Smart As. Yes, indeed. We got all these folks. I got a bunch of stories lined up here for you today. Um, anything I want to tell you about prior to, to getting into these stories? Not that I could think of. I posted some new photos of the garden yesterday over on my website, uh, grimnir.xyz. Uh, you can go check those out should you so desire and see how the uh, garden is coming along. It's coming along. Uh, I, I, I'm surprised, but it's it's still it's still growing. Stuff is still growing. I got flowers uh, now, which means probable fruit on uh, honeydew melons, on uh, b -b 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 cantaloupes, and it looks like there might be one developing on a watermelon plant. Also on the tomato plant, a uh, couple tomato plants that I have, which are the bigger ones, uh, the smaller ones not so much yet. Um, uh, strawberries are still growing, uh, jalapenos are still growing, nothing major there yet, so hopefully we'll get some of those, but if I do, it'll be a late, uh, late season for either the strawberries and uh, the jalapenos there. Um, pretty much out of luck at the bell peppers. They haven't, they've never sprouted, so. <laughs> anyway, that's the garden update. Um, it was cooler today than it has been over the past several days here. Uh, they they said this morning, they, the uh, weather dork bot, said uh, this morning the high was going to be 75, but it's 84 degrees right now where I am sitting, so... So much for that high temperature, low high temperature. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, that's 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 about it. I don't really have any other uh, personal stuff to tell you about. So let's get right to it. 
now that we're, what, five minutes into the show here already. And here we go. We're kicking it off tonight with a tech dirt story. And this is uh, from the seems like it's time for a refresher course department. If you're not familiar with tech dirt, uh, yeah, they always label their uh, their various stories and their goofy department names that they come up with for that particular story. It seemed to fit the case there. So here it is. This posted on the July 1st, 2019 by a guy named Tim Cushing. College forgets how the First Amendment works. Targets its own student newspaper with a public records request. (laughs) You gotta love it. A California community college has discovered open records requests. It's not receiving them, which would be normal. Instead, it's filing them and doing so, uh, and in doing so, it's attempting to bypass the state's journalist shield law by pretending the party it's FOIAing is a public entity. In an apparent attempt to regain narrative control of an incident involving the college's administration and the student government, Southwest College is seeking to obtain the recording of that event by the school student newspaper. The recording is of a student government election that was abruptly canceled by the school's president in May, apparently over a bogus Instagram post that suggested one group of students was going to engage in interracial violence. The school was rebuffed when it swung by the newspaper to ask for a copy of this recording, so it decided to go with Plan B, Public Records Request, as FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education reports, the school is attempting to obtain something protected by the state's shield law. The school is aware of this because the student newspaper told it as much when it asked the first time. So it made an official request and appended a lot of garbage to its request in an attempt to talk to the newspaper to talk to talk the newspaper into believing it was subject to public records requests. Less than a week later, the administration hand delivered a second letter to the permanent advisor, now back from medical leave, incorrectly alleging that the newspaper was a government actor and thus subject to California Public Records Act. Further, the Title IX director claimed that not producing the records was a subversion of public rights access uh, in violation of the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. It's not. (laughs) The school is so, so, so very wrong. It has now received a letter, which they have a link here to a PDF of that, of its own from fire crafted by Adam Steinbaugh that enumerates the many ways the college screwed up. To begin with, the college's interpretation of the state's public records law gets everything backwards, intentionally, of course, you know, uh, because they wanted what they wanted and they didn't care about anything else. Uh, The novel theory underlying the district's request that student organizations are subject to the California Public Records Act because they are entities that are part of the larger Southwestern College Community College District are and are engaged in activities funded by the college district and produced by students finds no support in the CPRA. The CPRA does not confer a public right to access records of private entities but instead allows public access to public agencies. The school's belief that the student newspaper, well, stated belief, I don't want to go ahead and give them that, but uh, that's what they call it here. The student's belief the student newspaper is as public as the university where it resides is also wrong. As Steinbaugh notes, the paper is an auxiliary organization distinct from the college. 
If the school truly believed the paper was part of its public whole, it would have ha- it would have approached a separate office of the school's administration to submit its public records request. Furthermore, even if the school was right and the paper was subject to the state's public records laws, the paper would still be well within its rights to withhold the recording. The paper's First Amendment rights, along with the state's shield law, would give it all the permission it needed to deny the request. A the deference afforded to journalist protection of confidential sources and unpublished information cannot be understated. There is a paramount public interest in the maintenance of a vigorous, aggressive, and independent press capable of participating in a robust, unfettered debate over controversial matters. Uh, anyway, so you can see, and they've got, like I said, they got the documents in here, but uh, this school... Uh, They wanted to go after somebody for saying a certain something, something they had no right to do. The school knew better. They they denied knowing better. Uh, And and they were just being typical bureaucratic scumbags. And uh, so, to hell with them. (laughs) Oh, and to hell with who else? To hell with the Supreme Court. Yes, in a deity. Hey there, Miss Van Mita. How are you? Do I see a Chloe over there? Oh, nope, a day. I don't know. She's around. All right. Uh, anyway, so. <laughs> so, yeah, the uh, Supreme Court, the Scrotus, uh, as I like to call them, of the, uh, yeah, uh, says state federal trials do not violate double jeopardy, which is a massive lie. Massive, massive lie. But that's what they said, and that's what they're going with. On June 17th here, posted on UPI.com, the United States Supreme Court on Monday of that week declined to change a legal rule that allows both state and federal prosecutors to try someone for the same crime. Here's the thing. Is it a federal crime? If so, the state has no place prosecuting the person. Is it a state crime? If so, the federal government has no place prosecuting that person. So you got to make up your mind which one it's going to be. Whatever you're thinking you're going to charge and try somebody on, it falls within somebody's jurisdiction and not both. But that's not what the Supreme Court said. The Supreme Court voted 7-2 to two to say charging someone on both levels for the same crime does not violate constitutional protections. Double jeopardy. Um, it, it, yeah, wrong, wrong, wrong. But they're not going to listen. Nobody's going to listen to me. They're going to listen to the Supreme Court because apparently the Supreme Court sets all the rules. It don't matter what kind of legislation or uh codes or laws or anything like that is in place, if the Supreme Court says that's no good, then everybody pays attention to the Supreme Court. I don't know why. There's nowhere that I've read within the Constitution that said that the Supreme Court has that kind of power. But they've kind of taken it on. People believe it to be true. And so apparently it is. It's one of those myths that people just believe in. I guess people repeated it enough times so that now, and that when the Supreme Court says this is how it goes, that's just how it goes. These nine folk. Anyway, the case involved Terrence Gamble, an Alabama man who was unable to possess a firearm because he was a felon. Again, unable to possess a firearm because he was a felon. Now, when I read the Second Amendment of your Constitution of the United States, it says that your right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It doesn't say shall not be infringed unless, but that's the way that's been taken. That's the way that's been changed. All these gun laws that are in place, they they should all be all tossed out on their butt. They have no right to make a 
felon unable to own a firearm. It's just, it's not correct. Uh, but they've done exactly that. Anyway, so he was uh, unable to own a firearm because he was a felon and who was charged by both state and federal prosecutors. He argued both prosecutions violated the double jeopardy rule. The court, however, said established law says state and federal governments are separate sovereigns. Still, somebody has to have the jurisdiction. They can't both have it. And each prosecute for the same offense. Uh, Or can, anyway. Justice Samuel Alito uh, delivered the majority opinion. We have long held that a crime under one sovereign laws is not the same as offense as a crime under the laws of another sovereign. So then why not just let all kinds of various sovereigns Am I, am I having a problem? I don't know. All right. Uh, why, why not just let all kinds of various sovereigns uh, go ahead and do that? I mean, maybe the King of England or the Queen, I guess at this point, wants to do it. She's a sovereign, right? Uh, why is that person themselves not a sovereign? <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's all ridiculous. Anyway, so the, the Supreme Court said this is the way it's going and that is the way that it went. Uh, I, I disagree with everything about this particular thing here. Uh, the Constitution is at this point nothing more than just a, just, a, just a piece of toilet paper. Every part of that Constitution has been violated from, from the very date it was issued. And it, well... It's gotten much worse. I mean, they've gotten much more blatant about doing things like this now. Uh, it's it, it, it's 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 uh, but people always hold it up as look, I've got this protection here. You don't. Anytime the government wants to say you don't have that protection, it don't matter what's in your constitution because they will trample it underfoot. Yeah, well, take that for what it's worth there. I, I mean, there's the, what what can you or I or other people do about it if they are not going to listen? <laughs> Rob works like a sovereign anyway. I I agree, <laughs> but uh, if uh, unless you're talking about individuals as sovereigns, because every individual is a sovereign, or they should be considered as a sovereign, they should at least consider themselves as a sovereign. You know, yeah, yeah, me too. Huh, says I'm a leave me the fuck alone kind of guy. As am I. <laughs> All right, so uh, this next post here, because I, I can't keep going on about that. I, I get too uh, annoyed by the whole thing. Um, anyway, so posted over here on the Daily Coin on June 17th by John Rubino. He asks a fairly important question, but. I think it's only part. His question only answers part of the overall answer because I don't think this one thing is going to cause the problem. Uh, I think the the problem is underway as we speak and uh, this has not actually occurred yet. But it could it could be coming very soon as we see the rhetoric being being blasted up. And the question is Will a false flag Iran war cause a financial crisis? I hope it does. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. (laughs) Anyway, so uh, this is by uh, John Rubino for the dollarcollapse.com website. Just a couple of weeks ago, the financial world's biggest worry was the plunging price of oil. Supply was up, stockpiles were building, and speculation was pointing towards $40 a barrel, a price at which the fracking shale oil, quote, miracle, unquote, would evaporate. A trillion dollars of related junk debt would default, taking a big part in the leverage speculating along, uh, along for the community along for the ride. Then it all changed. Someone attacked some ships and oil infrastructure in the Middle East. The United States and Saudi Arabia immediately 
without any information whatsoever, whatsoever other than they did it, uh, accused Iran. And now the fear is that a major regional war will erupt or interrupt the flow of oil, sending its price way up and causing a financial crisis at least as severe as the shale oil uh, debt collapse, which for New Mexico um, budget would be fairly devastating. <laughs> uh, there is a legitimate concern for two reasons. First, oil shocks uh, oil shocks have happened in the past, most notably during the Arab-Israeli War of the 1970s. So we know what they do, and it just generally is not pretty. Gas prices jump, workers can't afford their commute, the economy slows dramatically, and pretty much everyone other than domestic energy companies suffer badly. Secondly, and potentially more serious, the pretext for war is so blatantly false that it risks destroying what little credibility the United States government has left. Think about it. With the U.S. doing everything it can to delegitimize and destabilize Iran while positioning assets for invasion, Iran's leaders start attacking oil tankers in its offshore waters. What? Does that make any sense whatsoever? Hell no! Much more likely is that uh, this is yet another false flag. A Gulf of Tonkin, if you will. It, th th that is, an incident faked to give a pretext for war. And a hugely clumsy one at that. For readers who aren't clear on the false flag concept and its ubiquity in geopolitics, here are just a few of the dozens of documented examples. Japanese troops blew up a train track in 1931 blamed it on China, used it to justify the invasion of Manchuria. After taking power, the Nazis burned down their own parliament building and blamed the communists. Later on, they faked attacks on German citizens and blamed the Poles to justify the subsequent invasion of Poland. In 1939, the Soviets shelled one of their own villages and blamed Finland prior to invading. In 1954, Israeli terrorist cells operating in Egypt bombed U.S. diplomatic facilities, leaving behind evidence implicating Arabs. The CIA hired Iranians in the 1950s to pose as communists and stage bombings in Iran in order to ignite a rebellion against the democratically elected government. After the rebellion succeeded, the United States installed a hand-picked Dictator. The United States staged a naval engagement, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, and blamed the North Vietnamese, providing a pretext for entering the Vietnam War. The FBI used provocateurs in the 50s through the 1970s to carry out violent acts and falsely blame them on political activists. In 1984, Israel faked radio messages that linked Libya to terrorism. The United States bombed Libya immediately thereafter. Russia blew up an apartment building, uh, apartment buildings in 1999 and falsely blamed it on the Chechens in order to uh, justify an invasion of Chechnya. The list goes on seemingly forever, but these examples are enough to make the twin points that one, lots of countries employ false flag attacks, and two, the United States is especially fond of them. This is just one problem this time. We're on to it. <laughs> Everyone is on to it. We know your tricks. We know your games. You're not getting away with it, even though you'll still go ahead and do it and keep telling your lies so some people will believe you. But we know what you're up to. Even the New York freaking Times, which has never met a Mideast war it didn't love, sees through this deception. As Trump accuses Iran, he has one problem. 
his own credibility. For, this is from the Times here. To President Trump, the question of culpability in the explosions that crippled two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman is no question at all. It's probably got essentially Iran written all over it, he declared on Friday. The question is whether the writing is clear enough to everyone else. For any president, accusing another country of an act of war presents an enormous challenge to overcome skepticism at home and abroad. But for a president known for falsehoods and crisis churning bombast uh, to test the credibility uh, appears far more daunting. Now let me stop there and say that because they go on and they, they and they're pounding on Trump's head for uh, a good few paragraphs here, several paragraphs. The thing is, every single one of the presidents, I don't care which one you go to, you can go all the way back to George Washington if you like. They all lie. They all make stuff up in order to achieve their goals. So to point out that this guy is the, is the bad one, he's the one known for falsehoods. Really? You're going to tell me Obama wasn't? Bush Jr. wasn't? Uh, Bill Clinton? Bush Sr.? Reagan? <laughs> Carter? Ford? Nixon? Come on! J <laughs> LBJ? JFK? Pick one! Keep going back! I Eisenhower! Uh, they're, they're all they're all a bunch of freaking liars. And, and they all, Woodrow Wilson? Well, anyway. Uh, <laughs> there's not a good one in the bunch of them. Uh, they're all liars and they all do it in order to, to push whatever agenda forward in order to make you believe. And they're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Whether actually, you actually believe it or not, they're going to go ahead and do what they're going to do. And they're just hoping that uh, maybe if, if they could convince enough of you that what they've said is actually the truth, at least until after it's over with, uh, then maybe there won't be a huge uprising. Uh, which, of course... They don't really have a problem with that either. They would probably love a huge uprising so they could quell that uprising in the most violent way possible. That's the government of your United States. And it's the government of every other country as well. They, they all do the same thing. Uh, I can only point to the ones here because I live in within the boundaries of this violent monarchy. <laughs> and maybe it's not a monarchy, but... Uh, it's not a democracy. It's not a republic. I don't know what the hell you would call it. Uh, anyway, uh, combine these two problems, a Middle East war, sending oil much higher, and a near universal lack of belief in the rationale for that war, and the remaining faith in the American competence and honesty just might evaporate. That's a little bit of wishful thinking there. Uh, take this back to the finance, specifically to the monetary system, based on fiat currency, which depends for its value on our collective trust in the people managing it. Do you, anybody have trust in the people managing it? The Federal Reserve? I mean, you may think it's the United States government, but uh, no, no, it's got nothing to do with the government whatsoever. Uh, and the Federal Reserve is, is merely a branch of the global oil uh, banking cartel. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, the Fed will respond to an oil crisis by cutting interest rates back to or below zero. But this time, it will, but will this be met with euphoria as in the past or with skepticism as happened in Europe recently? If it is the latter. Remember that what gold did last time, there was both an oil shock and a loss of faith in government. And they, of course, they point back to the year of 1980 when the gold price shot through the roof. And all, so did silver, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and and, and I'm, all, I'm, I'm all for the, those prices doing that, but not not at the cost of a war, not at the cost of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly uh, millions of, of lives so that these bastards could go ahead and, and, and make all kinds of money. No, I, I, I am not for that in any way whatsoever, although I am for the uh, increase in the, in the value of those metals or the uh, perceived value of those metals so they'll be valued higher against the fiat dollar, the fiat Federal Reserve debt notes, 
um, which they should be much, much higher anyway, and they would be if it weren't for all the manipulation going on. And that has been going on for many, many years now. I was reading an article earlier today. I, I don't have it up here. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter too much to this other than the fact that it's tied directly to this. And the article I was reading was about how the uh, International Monetary Fund granted the, the country of Ecuador a huge grant, loan, however you want to look at it, as long as Ecuador went through with all of these various draconian measures against their people, their own people. And the president of Ecuador, who's basically like the other presidents I described here, um, uh, will do whatever it takes in order to push his agenda through and to hell with all the people that are living there that probably maybe thought they actually voted him in, although voting people in is not not a reality either, but that's a whole other story we don't need to get into here. Um, (laughs) Anyway, but this article posted on June 17th uh, from uh, the mindunleashed.com. And like I said, you could tie this directly back into that IMF loan grant uh, uh, to Ecuador. Ecuador just gave the Pentagon permission to use Galapagos Islands as an airstrip. Uh, the Galapagos Islands are one of the most biodiverse regions in the entire world home to a number of species that are found nowhere else on the planet. The the Galapagos Island archipelago in Ecuador is one of the most biodiverse regions. Uh, uh, And it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which I don't really care about or for UNESCO or any of those other groups such as that. Anyway, so naturally, the U.S. military wants to use one of its islands as an airstrip and do terrible things to it. Ecuadorian Defense Minister Oswald Jarin announced President Lenin Marino's administration's decision to allow the Pentagon to expand an existing airfield on San Cristobal Island, Cristobal, Cristobal, Cristobal Island for U.S. spy planes targeting drug traffickers in comments to Telesure on June 12th. The airport at the southwest end of the island is in the city of Puerto Bacarazo Marino, okay? Uh, According to the Independent, a U.S. Air Force Boeing 707 plane carrying radar surveillance in a Lockheed P-3 Orion plane will patrol the Pacific Ocean using the Galapagos as a launching off point. The Ecuadorian National Assembly is not sold on the proposal. In a vote on June 13th, El Universo reported 106 of the Assembly's 137 members cleared the way for calling on Jaron and Environmental Minister Marcello Mata to appear before the Chamber's Commission. Uh, Carlos Viteri, an Assembly member from the southern region of Soriaco Padaza, and a member of the Revolution Cuadana Party, <laughs> yeah, easy for you to say, said that allowing the U.S. to operate off the airstrip was vassalage, which um, apparently, uh, I, I don't know what that means, vassalage. Now, what is being proposed by the government through the Ministry of Defense is unacceptable, Vateri told El Universo, and the fact that it intends to cede an inch of Ecuadorian territory should be prohibited. But again, he got that huge IMF loan, so uh, they're going to do whatever the IMF says. Uh, anyway, I, I, I don't really need to get into it uh, too much, but let me just say this. They want to use it to go after drug traffickers. Why? Just leave them alone. Who's, whose business is it? about these drugs. Just let those drug traffickers alone, uh, for one. And why is the United States going 
thousands of miles away to go after drug traffickers when they got plenty to go after right here if they want to. All they got to do is go to the CIA. They're the ones importing the freaking drugs. <laughs> so, so unless they're going down there to try and steal these people's product and hand it over to the CIA. Oh, man, I tell you. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Let me get a sip of water here. <laughs> Okay, from TechCrunch.com, posted on, well, it just says one month ago. There's no date on there? All right, one month ago, whatever that means. Uh, Homeland Security has tested a working Blue Keep remote code execution exploit. Yep, Homeland Security's cyber agency said it has tested a working exploit for the Blue Keep vulnerability capable of achieving remote code execution on a vulnerable device. To date, most of the private exploits targeting Bluekeep, I should say targeted by Bluekeep, I would say, uh, would have a would have triggered a denial of service condition capable of knocking computers offline. But an exploitable exploit able to remotely run code or malware on an affected computer, an event feared by the government, could trigger, trigger a global incident similar to the WannaCry ransomware uh, uh, attack in 2017. So what are you saying? What are you, what, what are you, what are you saying here? That this uh, ransom, this WannaCry ransomware was actually pulled off by a state actor? <laughs> the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA or CISA, confirmed in an alert on Monday it had used Bluekeep to remotely run code on a Windows 2000 computer. I don't know who's still running Windows 2000. I always liked Windows 2000. That was really my favorite Windows of all time. Um, but again... I don't know people still running Windows 2000. Not that there aren't plenty of them out there, probably uh, people that have, you know, servers set up on Windows 2000. A anyway, Windows 2000 was not included in a Microsoft advisory. A spokesman for CISA uh, said the agency coordinates with external stakeholders to validate vulnerabilities. A Microsoft spokesperson later told TechCrunch that there's no plans to patch Windows 2000, which ended support in 2010. <laughs> Although no public exploit exploits have been released <laughs> that we know of. Yeah, right, because they said the same thing about the, uh, the WannaCry, which was actually a uh, uh, CIA-built thing. Anyway, CIS's uh, alert services as a warning that malicious attackers could soon achieve the same results. Both Microsoft and the federal government, as if there's a debt separation there, <coughs> have sounded the alarm in recent weeks over the risks posed by Blue Keep. The bug, also known as CVE 2019-0708, meaning it came out uh, on uh, July 8th there, um, is a critical critical re rated bug that affects computers running Windows 7 and earlier, including several operating systems. The vulnerability can be used to run code at the system level, allowing full access to the com computer, including its data. The bug is also a wormable, meaning it can spread from a single computer connected to the internet to every other affected device on your local network. Microsoft issued patches last month, but as many as a million devices remain vulnerable. So if you did your uh, updates, your security updates for, for Windows, you're probably fine. Maybe. Kevin Beaumont, a UK-based security researcher, said in a tweet that the number of affected devices 
will be way, way higher once the exploit code hits inside of an organization. The NSA earlier this month also issued a rare advisory warning users to patch in the face of growing threats of exploitation. So, uh, yeah, if you uh, haven't run your security patches, you don't need to run all the other patches for, for Windows, but uh, if you have those, then I, I would certainly uh, take care of that if you are running Windows 7 as, as I am or earlier. Yes, malware bytes definitely catches that bug. I remember the update that uh, said that, that it caught that. Um, so does Komodo, too, by the way. Anyway, <laughs> I imagine most of the, the major uh, anti-virus, anti-malware people, uh, anti-ransomware folk, they, they all catch it. Um, at this point, it, it's widely known, so... Uh, anyway, so we got we got dog lovers here. We got people here that have dogs, or even if they don't have dogs, they love their pooches or other people's pooches. And sometimes you'll look at those pooches, and they'll be looking at you with these big sad eyes, and you'll go, "Oh, baby, what's going on? What's oh, what's up? Those dogs are messing with you." Yes, indeed. <laughs> At least according to this LiveScience.com article posted on June 18th by Brian Spector. <laughs> Dogs evolved sad eyes to manipulate their human companions. <laughs> those, those, those dogs are dicking with you. <laughs> oh, about 30,000 years ago, a wolf decided to give up the wildlife, commit to a steady relationship, and become the first dog. Today, dogs and humans are undisputed best friends of the animal kingdom, and according to a new study, that camaraderie may have been propelled by some serious emotional manipulation. Is Pippi looking at you, Beetle? Is Pippi giving you them sad eyes? <laughs> In a study published on June 17th in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, researchers looked at the evolution of puppy dog eyes, the signature eyebrow raised look of sadness that any dog can employ to escape virtually any consequence, and found that the expression finds its source in the powerful eye muscles that seem to have evolved specifically to mimic human emotions like dog like owner and a, <laughs> in a small survey of dogs and wolves the researchers found that the muscle is uniformly present in modern dogs but conspicuously absent in their wild cousins the ability to make this hand dog expression which closely resembles the look of confused sadness oft worn by human babies uh, may trigger a nurturing response in humans who behold it, the authors wrote, and could therefore be an evolutionary advantage to the doggos. We hypothesize that dogs' expressive eyebrows are the result of selection based on humans' preferences. The researchers wrote in the study, uh, in only 33,000 years, uh, domestication transformed the facial muscle anatomy of dogs specifically for facial communication with you, the human. <laughs> oh. To reach these conclusions, the authors examined the eye muscles in six dead dogs and four dead wolves of varying breeds. They found that the five of the six dogs had thick muscles capable of lifting their eyebrows intensely. The only breed that didn't was the Siberian Husky, which is a breed close, closely related to the wolves. The wild wolves, meanwhile, were either missing that eyebrow lifting muscle entirely or had a thinner, st stringier version of it. The researchers coupled these anatomical studies with behavioral analysis in which 27 shelter dogs 
and nine wild wolves were filmed up closely by a human with whom they were unfamiliar with for two minutes. The researchers recorded how often the animals raised their eyebrows during the interaction and unsurprisingly found that the dogs made puppy dog eyes about five times more than the wolves did. The dogs also raised eyebrows significantly higher than their wild cousins. According to researchers, these findings suggest that some selection process uh, has encouraged domestic dogs to involve a more human facial anatomy than wolves in just a few tens, th tens of thousands of years. It's likely that they hypothesize, or they hypothesize anyway, that these anatomical changes are a result of interaction with people who may be more likely to favor dogs capable of making expressions that could almost pass for human. <laughs> Sock Puppet says his dog reads lips. That's a good one. And it, it, it might, uh, dogs do understand a lot of human language. They know certain words that you say um, and, and they know certain actions that you take. So reading lips is probably not that far off. Anyway, this is just a hypothesis, of course, and some dog experts told the Associated Press the study's sample size prohibits any sweeping conclusions about canine evolution. Still, gaze into the eyes of a forlorn corgi puppy for a few seconds, and it's hard to argue with these results. Dogs are clearly doing something to get into our mushy human hearts and brains, and we're okay with that. Because <laughs> we love the doggies. Oh, dog is, dog is a co. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, dogs are awesome. All right. <laughs> From the uh, no no tricks zone dot com, posted here on June twenty sixth, twenty nineteen, by P. Gasolina. Austrian Weather Agency says glaciers have recovered due to a snowy winter. Hey, imagine that. Record June snow depth. So it snows in the winter and glaciers grow. Huh. Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, Austrian, not Australia. Did I say Australia anyway? Austrian, the ZAMG National Weather Service here reports the glaciers have recovered in the Alps due to a snowy winter. ZAMG, the strongest growth in 20 years, by the way. ZAMG confirmed that last winter, the glaciers in the Ho, H-O-H-E, Tarun, <laughs> have grown more strongly than they have for the last 20 years. Austria's ZAMG Meteorological Institute reminds, however, that the figures that really count are the ones that come in the end of summer, because those are the ones they count on to try and tell, to try and manipulate you with their sad puppy dog eyes that, oh no, the world is melting, uh, everything is getting hot, we're all gonna die. Wait. Yet, the strong growth over the winter comes as a surprise to you, I guess. Uh, the, the Hobie Tarn glaciers have grown up to 25% when compared to an average winner. To an average winner over what time period, dark face? Uh, the, the, growth, the growth is equivalent to two, two more than meters of water. What? The growth is equivalent to two more than meters of water. I, I don't know. That's bad syntax there, and I don't know what you, exactly you're trying to say. Uh, anyway, <laughs> to determine the mass increase last winter, the snow depth was measured using some 560 probes scattered on the glacier. Snow density and snow temperature were also measured at a further nine points. The average snow depth at the Goldberg Keys was 440 centimeters and, and at the Kleinfenbuch Keys, 400 centimeters. Uh, record June snow set height at uh, Ru Rudolf Schutte. <laughs> These foreign words, man. Anyway, after the measurements in April this year, the cool and humid May caused the snow cover in high mountains to grow by another 100 to 150 centimeters. Occasionally, 
There were even records at the ZAMG weather station, Rudolf Schutte, uh, a snow depth of 342 centimeters. You know, Cirque would probably smack me upside the head for pronouncing these uh, these words that way. Anyway, a snow depth of 342 centimeters was measured uh, at uh, June on June 1st, 2019. This is the highest snow height in June at this measuring station. The previous June record was set at 310 centimeters on June 4th, 1980. But see, they don't give you, uh, they, they say it's the uh, b- 20, better than average winter, but they don't give you the time frame of when that average winter has been measured to or from. Uh, I, I mean, if you, if you want to talk about 50 years, is that the average winter? 100 years? 1,000 years? 10,000? 1 million years? How far are you going back, guys? Don't believe their their propaganda. That's all. Okay, this next one is a useful thing that uh, you may want to go into and look out. It's posted on Reason.com, and it was posted on April 25th of this year. Check out this new database of corrupt cops. USA Today, of all places launches an important new tool for tracking officers who have been fired for misconduct. Now, of course, there's many, 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 many cops that are out there being corrupt and wrong and doing bad things that have not been fired for their misconduct. Either way, uh, this this is a, a good resource to go to, especially when you get some of these cop suckers out there, bootlickers, it's a, that doesn't matter what, what the cop's done. It's always the, the person's fault. The innocent, un, unarmed person sitting on a park bench that this cop just came up and shot for no apparent reason. It's always that person's fault. Well, he shouldn't have been sitting there. <laughs> he shouldn't have been breathing, apparently. Anyway, so USA Today partnered with an affiliate n- uh, newsrooms and a nonprofit group in Chicago to launch an important new database that documents law enforcement officers with the records of misconduct. Part of that database is now available for public searches. Part of it. I don't know know why part of it. USA Today has documented at least 85,000 cops who have been investigated or disciplined for misconduct over the last decade. Uh, But this initial document dump focuses just on the 30,000 cops who have been been decertified by various state agencies for misconduct. Anyway, let's read the uh, whole details of this right here. And and, uh, there's a link to the database at the end, and you can go in there and uh, do your own little searches and and find out which corrupt, bad, terrible cops have done bad and terrible things. But we know there's a lot of bad and terrible cops that we can actually point to by name, Art Acevedo, Uh, that just get away with it time after time after time and are praised as heroes. And they're not going to be in this database because they've never been investigated for their terrible corruptness. Art Acevedo. (laughs) Uh, So anyway, check that out over there on Reason.com and it links over to... uh, the actual uh, database itself, which is on uh, da, 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 USA Today got USA Today dot com. There's a link at the bottom of that article, and all these links will be posted in the post show blog uh, for you all. Now I know this next story. I hope you're all sitting down. Uh, I, ho- I hope that you are calm so that this this doesn't shock or surprise you in too much of a way. Posted on ZeroHedge.com, July 1st, 2019. Authored by Eric Azus via the Strategic Culture Foundation. The article is entitled, uh, U.S. Government Tops All for Creating Refugees. Yep, on June 19th, Statista headlined a number of forcibly deplaced people reaches new high and when one looks at the data one finds an even bigger story which stands behind those numbers this new report from the united nations documents statista's headline and it proves that the us of a 
regime change operations have actually created around half of the world's refugees. It proves that United States penchant for invading and trying to overthrow governments that its billionaires want to replace regime change has been by far the biggest of all single causes of refugees worldwide, vastly higher than any other government. Regardless of how bad those other governments might possibly be, the United States regime is far worse. And, at least as uh, being the cause of the uh, cause of the, the cause, the creator of the world's refugee problems. So all you folks over there in Europe that are fed up with all those refugees flooding into your countries, look across the pond and say, thanks a lot. <laughs> They've got a chart here showing the uh, rise in the number of refugees over the years. Um, and then it goes on to uh, more. Uh, infographic it says there's more infographics at Statista. Considering the country that the United States regime has re, uh, regime has recently regime changed, that's a tough phrase, or attempted to regime change, the U.S. regime invaded the Af Afghanistan in 2001, Iraq in 2003, Syria 2012 through 2019, and has been applying in order to overthrow the governments of Venezuela strangulation economic uh, sanctions, all of those four target uh, countries, Syria, Venezuela, Iraq, and Afghanistan, lead the list of nations that are bleeding the most refugees. The U.S. regime, regime change operations, the <laughs> U.S. regime's regime change operations, I could say that really, uh, abroad, and therefore certainly the leading cause of the world's refugee crisis. That's the big news in the new UN report, uh, though it is news that the report itself ignores. It says, yeah, well, we, we don't really want to talk about this too much. Yeah, since the United States pretty much funds the United Nations and NATO and all the other warmongers out there. Anyway, I'll let you read this. It's got charts and maps and graphs and such things like that. But just understand, when people start talking about refugee... <laughs> refugee crisis all over the place. Say thanks, government of the U.S. of A. Thanks so much for all of that. All right. And lastly, and we'll close out with this pretty much self-evident news. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if we call it news or not. <laughs> 28th of June here. RT.com, Russia Today. Orwell's 1984 no longer reads like fiction. It is the reality of our time. Yes, it is. <laughs> Seventy years ago, British writer George Orwell captured the essence of technology in its ability to shape our destinies in his seminal work, 1984. The tragedy of our times is that we have failed to heed his warning. No matter how many times I read 1984, the feeling of total helplessness and despair that weaves itself through Orwell's masterpiece never fails to take me by surprise. Although usually referred to as a dystopian futuristic novel, it's actually a horror story on a scale greater than anything that has emerged from the minds of prolific writers like Stephen King or Dean Koontz. What about Clive Barker? I mean, really, you put Coons in there and not Barker? Anyway, <laughs> the reason is simple. The, the nightmare world that the protagonist Winston Smith inhabits, a place called Oceana, is all too easily imaginable. Man, as opposed to some imaginary clown or demon, is the evil monster. In the very first pages of the book, Orwell demonstrates an uncanny ability to foresee future trends in technology. Describing the protagonist, Winston Smith's frugal London flat, he mentions an instrument called a telescreen, which sounds strikingly similar to the handheld smartphone that is enthusiastically used by billions of people around the world today. Now, I don't have time to go through the rest of this here, but I suggest you might want to 
because it is not only uh, entertaining in its own right, but it is also quite insightful. And um, you, you probably just like it. That's all. So there you go. Uh, go ahead and read it. It's an op-ed on, on, on RT. So uh, check it out. Um, I'm done. I'm out of time. Thank you all for tuning in for this here, episode 32 of Grim Leftovers. I'll be back again next week with episode 33. Ooh, how Illuminati can you get? Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, let's see, like I said, tonight, uh, about six hours from now, we'll be uh, Flash Somebody on RLM Radio doing his show in a perfect world. Grammy comes on on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Check the schedule over there on reallibertymedia.com for all of the rest of the shows that are here, and you will enjoy those, too, if you do tune in or listen to the podcast of them later on, whatever works. We're also over there. All the videos are on BitChute under the Real Liberty Media heading. So uh, thank you all so much, and have yourselves a great evening. Talk to you later. Peace.